You're listening to the Home Staging Show podcast. I'm your host Nilin. This is a show where we talk about all things real estate, home staging, to live and to sell. Welcome back to season ten. This is episode seven. This episode is brought to you by SocialLightVault.com. Are you overwhelmed with the marketing your home staging business? Stop wasting time worrying or wondering if you're doing the right things. From social media to email newsletter that get attention of listing agents, Social Light Vault makes marketing simple and effective. You don't need a huge marketing budget. You don't need a huge audience either. You just need real marketing tools that work and the right sales funnel to deliver new leads, even when you aren't working. The team at Social Light specializes in marketing for home stagers. Get started today by going to SocialLightVault.com. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Home Staging Show. So today on the show, we are going to talk about pest control. I know this is not our usual topic of styling, color, staging tips, or home staging business strategies, but pest control is important to talk about since it can delay the sale of your home. Today on the show, we have Franklin Hernandez of Nature Pest, an integrated pest management company located in Miami, Florida. It specializes in eco-friendly, natural, and organic pest control for homes, lawns, and gardens. He's also the host of the Pest Geek podcast. It is dedicated to training pest control professionals around the world on integrated pest management, which is also called IPM. The podcast is also aimed to educate the end users. On what the real pest control is, which is not chemically dependent solutions. So, without further ado, let's start the show. Hi, Franklin. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and what kind of services does your company offer? Ah,、oh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm so excited. I was up last night for like two hours. Preparing for this because I had no idea really how this was going to go, but I am so excited to be here. So thank you so much. But I started in this industry 12 years ago and in the pest control, and totally unrelated to my background. My original background is in computer science, and for、uh, several years in in my early you know teens and twenties, I was an IT guy. You know, I, I did IT here in South Florida. For a large national trucking chain, and after that, I I basically transitioned into sales, and I was in sales for the majority of my adult life. I was、uh, a regional sales manager and a national、uh, sales territory manager, and I came back to Florida. And in 2006,、uh, my brother-in-law we had Hurricane Wilma, and my brother-in-law had a pest control route that he was doing. And he no longer was interested in doing pest control, and it was a little tiny company that he worked for. And he got into roofing. He said, "I'm I'm making more money doing roofing than I'm doing pest control." And at that time, I took a sabbatical from business for like two to three years, and I went to、uh, Bible college, and I was burned out, and I went、uh, and became a youth minister for for a couple of years. And he says, "You know, you're doing this. Come and help me on the weekends. See if you like it." And I started working with him on the weekends. Doing pest control, knowing absolutely nothing about pest control, and I fell in love with it. I loved plants. I love working outside. I'm an outdoor person. I love science. You know, I, I was the kid that had a chemistry set that was always blowing everything up, and、um, so tech stuff for me and, and understanding, you know, biology and chemistry and computers, this all stuff was like almost natural to me. And I absolutely fell in love with this industry, and 12 years later,、uh, here I am. That's amazing. And I know we didn't put it this in the question, but can you talk a little bit about what is pest control? Because I think most people think it's just basically spraying stuff from the can. Yeah, that's actually the biggest misconception everybody has about pest control. Basically, almost 100% of my customers, when they call on the phone, when their prospects are calling me, they either start out their conversation with "I need you to come and spray my house for bugs," or "I need you to come and fumigate my home," because for 50 years and people who grew up watching their parents get pest control, this is what they saw: a guy coming in with a can, spraying their baseboards, leaving and coming back next month and doing it all over again. 
And the commercials on television, if you look at every commercial on television about it's some guy with a can spraying something till it's dead. So people think that that is pest control. But in reality, that is not pest control. That is chemical application. And every pest control technician at one point has to do a chemical application. So what we specialize in and what we teach people is actually a concept I learned my second year or almost my first year in pest control where I thought I had learned something and then realized I really didn't know anything about pest control. And this is where most people in pest control find themselves, uh, especially depending on which company they work for. But I took a class. Um, my supplier said, hey, there's a great class. You're new at this. And there's a great class on, on uh, institutional integrated pest management. And I said, what the heck is that? I says, well, come to the class and, and you'll show. So it was an all-day class. And I took this class and it totally shattered everything I understood about pest control. What I found out is that what you get in the home and what real pest control is are two different things. And what's done in a hospital and what's done in a home are two different things. You could never do in a hospital what you do in a home, yet you still have to control pests. So I started learning about, you know, what are the like five-star hotels doing? Uh, what are the hospitals doing? What are our processing plants doing? Like uh, FDA inspected plants for medical facilities. Um, you can't spray in those facilities. And what I found is that it takes a really high level of technician to do that work that the guy, average guy doing home pest control is never going to be exposed to. And when I learned that being a business person, and being a, a tech person, I said, you know, what if we took these principles and we took all of it and repackaged it for the clients and sold them a high level of pest control that they've never experienced before, that they never knew existed? And that's what we did. And at that time, eco-friendly and natural and, and, and safe and all that wasn't on the radar when we started. I mean, and most people didn't even know. Organics was just taking off in the market. So that's what we did is we took that high level of care and we packaged it for customers. We found people that had cancer, that had kids that had um, diseases that they needed. They had disorders. They had allergies. And we found the market for people that didn't want chemical in their home. They just didn't know what to call it. And that's how, how you know we did that. So real pest control, and we're going to get into a lot of the little bit of of trying to demystify for your audience what pest control is. And if people think chemical first, but when we think of real pest control, we think of chemical last, believe it or not. And that's a total paradigm shift that has to happen in somebody's mind to be able to understand that that's what they've been exposed to and what they've been marketed really isn't pest control. Right. So what, so when you say chemical loss, so what are some of the things that you would do in pest control for clients? Well, that is an awesome question because what we have to do first when we take a client on um, that calls us and says, we want you to do natural, we want you to do organic. There is nothing more natural than prevention. You know, you heard of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Well, you know, a couple of processes of prevention is worth a gallon of chemical. And what we, we do is we tell people, look, pests need four basic things. So this is very simple. Pests need an opportunity. All pests are opportunistic in nature. They need a way into your home. They need a place to hide. They need water and they need food. So pretty much every home and every business has this, whether you have a little kitchenette or you have a restaurant, they all have this place and pests that generally are, are what are known as paradomestic. They can live inside and they can live outside. So they can easily find and live comfortably in homes. So if the customer focuses on making it inhospitable to pests and making it so that pests cannot come in. So a perfect example would be you have doors. And if you buy a new home, they have really nice windows that seal great. If you have a new doors, they have great seals that seal great. But if you have an older home, simply by changing your thresholds and changing the seals on your doors, you make it more difficult for pests to come in. So that, in essence, becomes natural pest control. 
Yeah, because I think uh, my mom, because California has been having droughts. And so there right. were a lot of rats in the neighborhood now. And so my mom's house, they have a rat problem. And then the rat guy came. He's like, the best thing to do is go around to make sure there's no holes that they can come in. Right. And then if you find a hole, you had to use these metal mesh things to block them because they can't chew through metal. So, so yeah, I really agree. Prevention is going to be huge in terms of cleaning pests. The, the industry, we saw the industry shifting because a lot of the chemicals that we had even 12 years ago are gone. And what we're finding is that chemical is becoming further restricted in the U.S. like it is in Europe, like it is in Canada, where they have very few chemicals that they can use. California, you, if you're in California, is one of those states that is leading the way. And we take a lot of our training uh, what we look at is what is happening in places where chemicals are very restricted and how are they solving these problems and, and start bringing that to our clients so that we stay ahead of this game. And California with rodents, you have a big problem in California where they're passing initiatives to get rid of rodenticides, especially what are known as second generation anticoagulant, because also when a, when a rodent eats a pesticide, it's an anticoagulant. And another wild animal eats that rodent. You know, you can actually affect wildlife. So you have uh, wild cats and 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 wild like owls that are eating these rodents. And so California is becoming really restrictive. You can only apply an inch of chemical around the outside of the property if you're using a surface, because it can go into the storm drains and you have a lot of water. Your bay, you know, especially in San Francisco Bay. Yeah. So these are, these are issues that we're contending with in the industry. And what we're trying to teach customers is, listen, in order for you not to use the chemical, you have to, it's kind of like changing your diet. You can't just drink medicine to fix a lot of your problems. If you change your diet, a lot of these problems go away. And it's the same way if you change. So yeah, if you're sealing those holes, if you are controlling water, another thing is controlling water around your property. Don't have standing water. Right. Because insects need water. So if you, if you don't, in your case, you're having a drought, but here in South Florida, we get 80 inches of rain in the season. Uh, we're a subtropical environment. We're in the perfect environment to test a lot of things. So sealing water, uh, don't leave, you know, places outside of clutter where insects and rodents and things can create harborage sites for themselves, eliminate it. Uh, you know, switch from the mulches around your home to maybe rock because mulch, you know, it, it, it breaks down into a lot of bio stuff that pests need and insects are there that they like to eat. So you create the environment is known as what is known in the industry as a habitat modification. If we can modify the habitat, where the, we make it inhospitable for the pest. The pest doesn't want to be there. So, so that becomes natural pest control. You see, not using the chemical is more natural than having to use it, even if we're using natural stuff. Because a lot of insect problems you can't solve with natural. You actually make it worse. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Because um, one of the things the rat guy came he, he recommended, well, do you want to spray rat poison around the property? And the first thing we said was no, because we have pets and right. it's harmful to the pet. What if, you know, a mouse died and she didn't know she go play with it. She can get poisoned as well. And um, we also have relatives with young children. They're running around the yard. We don't know what's going to happen. So, you know, for, for us as homeowners, we wanted to make sure that it's a good solution for people who are living in the house. Yeah, no, that is the best thing. The best advice that he could have given you is that. So that, that is an example of, of a pro in the field that is not trying to sell you a product, but actually selling you a solution. Sometimes that solution is overwhelming because a lot of, especially realtors come into this problem. They're selling property that is distressed and it's very hard for them to make all of these, you know, fixes like screens in the soffits holes on your roofs, you know, especially if you have tile roofs and you have all these angles, roofers make the roof so that water doesn't get in, but it doesn't, a lot of the time doesn't address the issues of rodents being able to get in if they climb onto your roof or squirrels. Yeah. Um, so exclusion really in wildlife control and in a lot of rodent control, exclusion is really the best solution long-term because if a squirrel gets into your attic and chews up your wires, you know, that's several thousands of dollars 
that it will cost you compared to the couple hundred and it might cause you to do an exclusion job. Yeah, that was one thing our rat guy told us as well, because on my mom's uh, house, there's a pine tree nearby and it's really large. And he told us that rats can climb trees and they'll jump onto the roof and try to find ways to get into the home because it's warmer, there's food, you know, there's water and stuff. So yeah, so I definitely agree with that. Like whatever you can do, I think I really don't like because I grew up in Taiwan and cockroach is very prevalent. And every household has at least a bunch of cans, just spray all the stuff. And our family don't like that, doesn't like that because it's chemical. You know, we have, you know, grandma and young kids and stuff. So it's not really a great solution. And I know that you specialize in eco-friendly, natural and organic pest control methods. So we talk about natural. Can you talk about eco-friendly and organic as well? Are there differences and what do those entail? Yeah, absolutely. They're total differences. Let's let's break it down just generally what this means. To be eco-friendly means to take a holistic approach in the environment and understand if you can understand the symbiotic relationships in the ecology of, of insects. So in other words, what do roaches need to survive? There's symbiotic relationship between ants and plant pests, you know, like if you've got aphids or you've got mealybugs or you've got white flies in the landscape, well, guess what? You're going to have ants. If you take care of that pest problem on the plant, because those insects suck on the plant and they produce what is known as honeydew, the excrement of the, of these insects is sugar. Well, what are a lot of carbohydrate rich products and what do ants need? They need the carbohydrates and they need the sugar to survive. So there's a symbiotic relationship. You get rid of the plant pest, you kind of get rid of the ant problem also. So there's there, the understanding eco-friendliness is about also reduction of pesticide, not having to use it or only using that pesticide when it's absolutely necessary, not the first option. And it all depends on what you're getting into. If you're dealing with a golf course or you're dealing with a homeowners association or you're dealing with a lawn, it can become about radical reduction. Well, we got fanatical about radical reduction because when we started thinking about eco-friendly, we didn't have a lot of the products we have today. So what we had to do is take courses in agronomy. We had to take courses in organic food production to understand this and figure out and understand these relationships. And what they were doing in organic food production was more related to what our specialty was, which was plant healthcare. You know, we specialize, you know, we have gardens that people spent, you know, 50, $75,000 designing, and they wanted to take care of these plants. So we figured out how to do it by educating the client, how to properly mow the lawn, how to properly regulate the water, and how to be fanatical about looking at all these things in the cultural care so that we didn't have to use the pesticide. When I started in the industry, when I started in my first uh, route, we were spraying monthly. And about six months later, I took a course and we figured out that by controlling the water and controlling, we could actually spray half the product on a yearly basis that we needed to. We could switch from older products to more modern products that were least toxic. It's not about becoming non-toxic because to be absolutely transparent and technical, you cannot be non-toxic with products because they have to kill something. So to claim that a product is non-toxic is actually a little bit deceptive uh, because you can't claim it because it has to kill the pest. So it has to be toxic to the pest. But it can also be toxic to beneficials like bees and it can be toxic to pollinators like wasps. We don't, we don't want a wasp nest, but we don't want to get, eradicate wasps because then we eliminate a lot of the pollination that goes on. So educating customers on looking at taking a holistic view of, of pest control is 90% of my job and helping them understand that it isn't as simple as switching because natural products, or let's get into organics because organic products are not really available a whole lot to homeowners and to us and the reason is because everything we know about organic is linked to basically food production. You see, so all of these products that they can use, if you read these labels, you have to wear respirators and body suits to apply them in an agricultural setting. Because they are organic doesn't mean they're inert, does not mean that they're non-toxic, they're not harmful to humans. They're applied in an environment where humans are not there. So these, a lot of these organic products that are available cannot be used in homes 
because they're not EPA approved. They didn't go through studies and we can't use them, even though they're they, what organic means simply in technical terms is that it has a, a um, carbon compound that when it degrades, it doesn't become another chemical. Unlike synthetic pesticides that become a degrade, they become another chemical that can be more harmful to the environment than the original chemical was. So that breaks down in the environment and then it doesn't have any residual on the plants and we can eat it and not have a problem. But once, so that's the difference. So now we're starting to have some biological products that are available like nematodes to deal with fleas and ticks, but it's mainly sold to homeowners because the price on those things are like 600 to 6,000% more expensive than synthetic chemicals. So most companies can't afford to do it from a business model because of the cost is so outrageous on these products. They're very limited. In natural, we have um, a, a new era known as 25B exempt products that have made it into market. We were one of the first people to adopt uh, 25B products, and we use it extensively in our practice. And 25B means that there is an exemption in what is known as the Federal Insecticide and Rodenticide Act that allows for these natural products to be used without federal registration because they have been general regarded as safe known as grass by the fda and they're over these, these are products you eat so oils from mint oils from thyme oils from cinnamon these are products that are generally consumed and are generally regarded as safe you notice they don't say they're safe they're generally regarded as safe because we still we still have allergen problems if you're allergic to cinnamon and we apply a cinnamon product you're going to have an allergic reaction you see, so uh, to, to classify them as safe is really not completely true. Um, so we were very careful to educate our customer that just because you want us to switch from and spray your indoor house with thyme oil doesn't mean we're going to be able to control the problem. And it doesn't mean that it's actually going to be good for you. If you have allergies to floral products, this will aggravate it in clients. So we, we try to use prevention as the first method which is what we have to do in organic facilities and things like that. So, so that's what we do. And, and so we're, we're able to get, we did, I mean, I pulled probably, I started using naturals when they first became available and found that it was a natural adoption for us for landscapes because we could control probably 80% of the pest problems in ornamental plants. And we started testing different blends and different mix. So now we have a blend that we make that has about seven oils in it. And what we started discovering also that we could prevent diseases because a lot of these oils are antiseptic, antibacterial. So what are some of the common pests that we will see in the homes? And as homeowners, what can we do to prevent these? So the number one pest that we get calls for, believe it or not, is ants. Ants are the biggest problem. And what makes ants difficult to control for people and what we try to do is if, if, like I said, we talked about before, you know, reducing the water, reducing things around the property because ants also have this problem. You have invasive species of ants that are your major problem. They eat glucose. They will eat proteins. They will eat oils. So cleanliness in the home is probably the number one thing. Controlling them yourselves can be done with a lot of the things that you get over the counter. But what I tell people is, don't use sprays when you're dealing with ants. Avoid using sprays. And here's why. Because sprays, the only thing you have access to over the counter are what is known as pyrethroids. And to ants, and especially the species of ants that invade your home, are known as tramp ants or ants that will fragment. And if you use these sprays, you make the problem worse. So get rid of spraying when you're dealing with ants and look for the bait products, the, the glucose bait products, these will solve, and granular bait products will solve your problem better than spraying because you will actually make it worse. The second thing you mentioned was roaches, especially large roaches. Inside the home, avoid the spraying also because you can't really deal with a, a – you can kill the pest that walks across a spray, but you can't get rid of it if it's in the structure. So going to baits is what we go for, whether they're boric acid baits or synthetic baits, much safer for you to use in your home because you're targeting, you're putting it in places, nobody's touching it. So that's how you deal with the two major pest problems 
that people get that we get calls on, which is ants and roaches. Right. And then how about fleas and ticks? Okay, fleas and ticks. We, what we educate the client on is that if you have a flea and you got a tick, usually it's because you either have a lot of wildlife or you have like rodents. But you also usually you find out because you have a pet. So what, I, what we tell people is if, if you take care of the pet first, if you take it to the vet and you deal with the core problem, which is, the, you know, putting it on either a chew or putting on the modern products to prevent that animal from being bitten because a lot of these insects transmit diseases to the pet. So let's protect the pet first. Then unfortunately, you have no options when it comes to spray because these pests are outside on your lawns is to spray. Now with, with the newer natural products, that is an option to spray with natural. And indoor, you're going to have to deal with a lot of the eggs of fleas. Fleas multiply A flea puts an egg every hour, 24 hours a day. So what happens with with, with fleas is that if you've got a thousand fleas, you've got a thousand eggs being laid in that home every single hour. And so what we have to do is deal with the egg problem, not the flea problem, really. And what we have to use for that case is known as insect growth regulators. And insect growth regulators, what it is, is a hormone. And fleas, unlike adults, they have to lose the hormone in order to get out of that egg and molt into a child or an adult flea. If we keep the hormone in that area, the flea basically dies in infancy. It can't, the egg doesn't hatch. And that's how you control for up to six months in the home. What the advantage of using an IGR over an insecticide is that the insect, the hormone doesn't affect us. We don't have juvenile hormones. So they're considered a very low-risk product. And if the spray company um, uses natural, natural tends to be a natural insect growth regulator also. So if, you, if you're using synthetic, then you would add that to the insecticide and you're doing both. You're, killing the, you're dealing with the egg problem and you're dealing with the adult. But surface spraying, but you can do it with natural. Unfortunately, you might have to leave your house for several hours when you do a, a flea control job because there's going to be a lot of residual in there because fleas jump, they don't crawl. So a flea will jump 13 inches at a time versus a tick that will crawl across a product. And fleas and ticks are in different families. So fleas are insects, but ticks belong to the arachnid family. They're, they belong to uh, the spider family, the mite family. So insecticides are very tough to work on ticks and, and they don't have juvenile hormones. So uh, IGRs don't, don't work for ticks. Okay, so you have to use uh, a chitin synthesis inhibitor, which is another type of IGR that damages that exoskeleton. They don't have bones. They have an exoskeleton. And if you damage that reproduction of that, it's a it's a polymer product they create. If you damage that polymer, then you don't need to use an insecticide. And again, we don't produce chitin. So that's an eco friendly way of doing it by using that. That is fascinating. This is all science. (laughs) It is. Wow. And and I think another really big one, especially in real estate, is termites and rats. So what are your solutions for those? Right. Termites is going to be a more area specific. You basically have three types of termites in the country. You have drywood termites, you have Formosan termites, and then you're going to have um, subterranean termites, depending on if you have, you know, eastern subterranean termites. But that is going to have to be something that has to be managed locally by a local professional because homeowners really cannot do their own termite work in some states because they it's a reportable to the state. It's known as a, a WDO, a, a, a wood-destroying organism, and it has to be reported. So, so it's, it gets much trickier because now you enter into homeowners' policies and legalese and that becomes more of, 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 of a legal problem down the line of, of disclosure to, to homeowners uh, in selling the home and things that have to be done. So that one's, uh, I recommend they get, uh, what I do recommend that people do for homes is get the, the, the house inspected, you know, at least once a year, if not every other year, by a real inspector. The, and, and what I mean by a real inspector is that there's two types of inspectors, those that go to sell you a contract 
for something to prevent it and those that actually do an inspection and will put in the time to spend three to four hours in that home inspecting it thoroughly to show that there is no termite damage or that there is termite active in the home and that you have to do something. And a free inspection is usually a sales pitch. And a lot of people want the free inspection because it's free, but you're going to spend 15 to 45 minutes in that home. There's no way you can do in a four bedroom, 4,000 square foot home, a thorough inspection in 45 minutes. It just can't happen. So what I tell people is pay a guy that does inspections. That's his job. You know, a couple, four or $500 for four hours worth of work uh, because you have a, a million dollar home and that's really peanuts, you know, when you're dealing with that. You know, that's what I, you know, I try to educate people on that part. Yeah, I think that's really important as well. And how about rats? Because I think most real estate, especially agents, they just put out traps basically, or those uh, really thick papers that sticky to catch them kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah, the, the glue boards is controversial um, because wildlife and uh, people advocates for wildlife, it's under fire. Um, the reason is the, the rat suffers. Yeah, it's very uh, and and. At, and, and agonizes in pain for days sometimes uh, while it dies. My thing is, uh, you know, the most humane, if you're looking at humane uh, thing to do is snap traps inside the home, not outside. You can, you can prevent the rat by getting in if you can seal it. But once they're inside the home, the best thing is to use snap traps. Um, but again, you have to know what you're doing because rat trap placement is vital. How you place that rat trap is going to depend on your efficacy of catching that rat. So learning about techniques, about how to put it up against the wall correctly, not putting it in the middle of the living room, making sure that if you're putting rat traps out, nobody's going to go into that home at night walking around and accidentally get their foot in a rat trap. That's very important. So putting them in cases sometimes, um, it may take longer because the rat will go into a case for several hours or several days sometimes. So Catching rats is not going to be something that can be done. I mean, I had one warehouse that had one rat and it took us two weeks to catch it because he was evading everything. He had plenty of room to wander in. Uh, so, if, so if the house is empty, if the house has food and people left food behind, you've got to make sure you get rid of all the food of competing food. There aren't dogs there and you're putting out, you know, dog food and water where they're feeding off of the dog food and water and avoiding the bait that you put in the trap. So removing the competition is vitally important so that there is no food competition. That's going to be vital to, to getting rat control, uh, especially in the home. And, and it's going to depend on your state because the advice I'm giving in general, some states require that you can't do a lot of this yourself, that you have to hire a professional. Um, so it's going to be on a, you know, and if you're international, you know, then you have international laws that are different. Right. And the last one is wildlife. I know some areas are very unusual, but like uh, my parents live in kind of more hilly areas where they got a lot of raccoons and deers that eat the plants and all the stuff and raccoons like go through all the trash. So what can you do to help to prevent from stuff like that happening? It, what, what you have to focus on is the inside of the structure of the home first, making sure that exclusion is done, going back to that. Uh, preventing them from getting into your home because they can cause real ton of damage. The next thing is if you have trash bins and stuff, make sure that it's sealable. The trash bins are all sealable. Don't leave bags out of food because they're going to tear through it and they're going to create, you're going to be feeding them unintentionally and bringing them into your neighborhood. So the idea of cleanliness and, and, and understanding how these wildlife behave, that they're looking for food, they're scavengers, and getting rid of all of that outside that's going to cause them to want to be there. So if there's no food, they have no reason to want to come there. Unfortunately, you can't stop them from wandering. A lot of the products that are available for repellents just aren't effective for all wildlife. So it's really hit and miss, uh, not really reliable. Second is do not attempt to do wildlife removal yourself. We get into diseases like rabies, which there's no treatment for. Oh. So avoid dealing with the, the, you know, cleaning up the, what is known as scat, uh, for bats and things like that, because you don't want to go into an attic and crawl in there without a respirator and a bodysuit. Because if you're breathing in the stuff that gets thrown into the air, when this stuff gets disturbed, you'll end up with lung diseases 
And that is really dangerous. So I don't recommend because the training that wildlife professionals have to go through, the shots they have to take, it's really extensive and it's not really an amateur job. I recommend that nobody attempt it, that they call a real wildlife professional because there's so many things that you have to deal with. But the basics is exclude them, keep them out. Don't create the environment. Don't put water out. Don't leave dog food out for your pets uh, because you're just going to bring them in to that area. That is very scary. Oh my God. One, one of our listeners, PJ, had asked, what is the best way to remove fire ants? Okay, so that one is actually a really simple one, believe it or not. Fire ants are, are, are going to happen when you start getting from the drier into the wetter season. And when you see fire ant mounds, the best thing to do is don't disturb them. The most eco-friendly way of doing it is using granular fire ant bait. And you will have to find one that is approved in your state. California has a lot of restriction on products. New York does too. Uh, A lot of everything in between is pretty much open. So finding a granular fire ant bait, even if you go to your over-the-counter at your big box stores, you can find it. Um, Like a product, you know, like Amdro, which is relatively available. You don't want to disturb the nest. That's the first thing. You don't want to disturb them because they won't feed if you're disturbing them. You want to put the bait on the mound like a tablespoon, and you're going to wait three or four days. And that mound should be dead. If you poke it in three or four days, you're going to find that there's no live ants in there. They're dead. And in larger areas like fields, granular application of specialty products just for fire ant or granular fire ant spread out across a field is your number one bet because that's the most, there's no spraying involved. There's no overuse of chemical and it's much more effective because the queens live underground. If you can't get the product to the queen, you're only going to kill the workers and she's going to produce millions of ants per acre. So it's not really efficient to spray for, for fire ants. Wow. That is really fascinating. Um, So once three to four days after that, the mound is basically, you can just push it over and, remove the whole thing yeah basically there's just dirt there there's nothing there you can just hit it with water and and the dirt is going to collapse because they they perform this dome over ground where the workers are and they have easy access to go gather food and stuff and bring it back so that's why they're there but they're known as mega colonies so there's hundreds of thousands of ants in the colony and that could be very painful for dogs and children if they step in them so that is the number one way it's just it's slower but it's, it's much more effective in the long term than trying to spray it. And our listener, Jessica, asked, what is the best bug solution that's not going to harm kids or pets? Right. The, bed, the best bug solution is if you don't understand what you're applying or what you're applying it to, don't use over-the-counter sprays. Get them out of your home. That would be my number one thing to tell people is those are not designed to control any problems. They are designed to you to spray stuff and stop you from screaming while that bug is running around in your kitchen. That is it. The best solution is seal, modify the environment, exclude. And if you're, if you're trying to use baits and they're not working for you and you've tried it and you failed, it is not because the bait is bad or the bait doesn't work. It's because you might have a pest that changes their feeding habit. And ants do this a lot and, and roaches will, will feed on different things. And at that point, you should really look for a professional that understands IPM, that understands integrated pest management, that is not going to need to spray the inside of your home to solve that problem. Get the pesticides away from the kids. Get it out of your home. The can of spray, it's really not that useful for you. What are some of the signs that would show that pests are already coming into your home? Right. So the number one thing, obviously, is the pest. You see it. There's, there's a live pest running around. Also, the dead pest. Okay. We don't consider a dead pest. It's dead, so it's, we ignore it. Well, if it's, a, if it's a nymph, it's in a different life cycle. Well, it had to be born somewhere. That means there's a parent somewhere. So they're different sizes, different little, little bugs, big bugs. You know, life, pest, that's a sign that you might have a problem. If you're finding them dead on their own, that means that they're getting in but they're dying because they either don't find anything to eat or they're just dying of natural life. You know, bugs don't live that long. So a couple of weeks to a couple of months, roaches can live a year or more 
up to two years, but generally most bugs, ants, very short life cycle, okay? Um, droppings, you're seeing stuff that little pellets here, little pellets there, you know, stuff really tiny, especially underneath your cupboards. What I tell people is if you can seal that pipe underneath all of your sinks with foam, because every contractor will make this hole and leave it there to run the pipes through and nobody ever seals it. And if you seal that, you will prevent pests from going behind your walls and breeding underneath that sink where they want to be. So that's technically where you're going to look for them underneath your sinks, especially in the kitchen. Um, behind your refrigerator, behind your stove, because they're going to want to go back there. It's warm areas, it's covered. There's easy access to food and water. Eggs, it sometimes are more difficult to identify what an egg looks like. Um, egg casings are very different. You're finding stuff chewed or damaged, especially in garages. You might have ho holes in your products. You might have some food pests, things like that. Yeah. So one of the pests I forgot to ask about is bed bugs because they're really persistent. So what happens when the home gets the bed bug? <sighs> yeah, that's a huge, it's becoming a major, major problem. Bigger than ever, it, it, it's exploding. And you got to go back just to a little bit of the science. The products that were originally used back in the 40s to control bed bugs was known as DDT. Oh, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what the problem with DDT is, it got canceled because of obviously a bunch of health problems. But DDT falls in that category of what is known as pyrethroids. And that is what is over the counter. Every single product that you can buy over the counter as a homeowner is a pyrethroid. They're in the same family. Well, guess what? They became resistant to DDT. They're also resistant to pyrethroids. So spraying for bed bugs, anybody that tells you they're going to come and spray your home and prevent bed bugs can't do it because they're resistant to a lot of the chemicals and 90% of the chemicals that are on the market that you can use in residential homes are all pyrethroids. doesn't matter the name or the brand. We got 20 something uh, pyrethroids and they're all the same product. They kill the same, the pest way. They, they kill the pest the same way. So dealing with bed bugs has become a organic and natural with using steam and heat and using vacuuming. And using non-toxic or, or, or reduced risk dust like diatomaceous earth are actually the easiest way to control it. The problem is it takes a long time of labor to do it. So heat, putting heaters in the home and dealing with that is the best way. Here's a problem that I find that we're dealing with more and more, and your audience will appreciate this. Short-term rentals. Yes, like Airbnb or people like hostels. Because I think New York had a huge outbreak at these accommodations. You know, somebody moves in for a day, they carry it in their suitcase and then, you know, went home with it, basically. So exactly. And what the difference between a hotel, like a five star hotel is five star hotels have protocols in place to deal with bed bugs. When you're sleeping at night and rooms are empty, at two in the morning, they have bed bug dogs coming in and sniffing those rooms to make sure that there isn't no bed bugs in there. And they have a proactive approach. Their staff, when they're removing bed sheets, they're trained to look for bed bugs in hotels. You don't have that training when you're a short term rental of understanding that biology of that bed bug. They don't have the training on how to prevent it because you can't prevent bed bugs. Because the problem is that the, the, the transmitter, and the food happens to be a human being. And what you're bringing into the place is a human being. And you don't know if they've been in taxis that are infected. They don't know if they've, been, if they've been where they've been sitting or laying. And they're bringing in their suitcases. They're throwing it on the bed. That suitcase has been in the trunk of a car where another suitcase was. And what happens is they want, we're getting calls constantly saying, I need a document saying I don't have bed bugs. And I said, that is expensive to do because we got to go in with a dog that costs about $250 to rent to inspect for maybe an hour that home and making sure you don't have bed bugs. And it's not simply as coming in with a flashlight and not seeing anything. We have to put monitors and come back in a couple of days and inspect for that and seeing if there's any bed bugs in those monitors. Yeah, I think it's really tricky because I remember in one of the travel forum, this woman shared that she saw a bed bug on the airplane seat. So it's really, really tricky. They can get anywhere. So once they get into your home, what can you do to get rid of them? 
And, and, and what that becomes really a professional job. It is that there's a lot of stuff out there, but understand that on the head of a screw, this is how bad it is. On a head of a screw, you can have a hundred bed bug eggs. Oh my God. So when we do a bed bug job, it's literally about two people, two to four hours per bedroom, because we have to take that entire bedroom apart piece by piece and treat with steam with vacuuming, removing the live bed bugs, steaming and killing the eggs on those mattresses and box springs, treating the inside of those box springs, crack and crevicing with a natural product, inch by inch, your drawers, taking those drawers completely out, making sure that everything has been washed, making sure that everything has been put through a dryer. Frames, picture frames have to be treated. Behind the walls, if you have an attic, the attic has to be treated because they will climb up and go to another room. So if you are in, a, in an apartment building and you bring in a bed bug, we have to inspect the room above, the room on the side, the room on the bottom. We have to inspect all four because it'll travel to all those units. Oh my God. So if you get a bed bug in an apartment unit and you're doing a short-term rental in an apartment unit and you get a bed bug, you're potentially liable for several thousand dollars worth of bed bug work. So how does bed bug travel once they get into the house? Are they, are they, are they like fleas that can jump like meters? No, no. They crawl. They kind of look like ticks. I mean, that's the closest thing I can get. And they crawl. The thing is they hide in cracks and crevices. And what they do is since the person sleeping in that bed is they're detecting the carbon dioxide that you exhale. And that's how they can detect that you're there. I see. And there's food. And then they come out at night when you're sleeping. And the reason you can't feel a bed bug bite is because they use an anesthesia when they bite you. So they can feed. And once they feed, they can go behind that wall in an outlet and be there for up to six months without having to feed again. Oh, my God. So you you sprayed the baseboards. And a guy says, I sprayed your baseboards. You, You can't have bed bugs. And the bed bug is still there because he's either on a picture frame or he can hide in that picture frame for six months and then start putting out eggs and breeding because he needs a blood meal in order to be able to reproduce the eggs. So an abandoned home that nobody's been living there for three to four months and then they move in and all of a sudden they have bed bugs. People say, well, you had to have brought them in. No, not necessarily. They could have already been there and you're just the next victim that was there. That's there now. That is crazy. So let's say you have bed bugs on a book, for example. If you put it in a plastic box and sealed it, it's still going to stay alive, basically. It can stay alive if it's had a blood meal, yes. Wow. It can't do it if it hasn't eaten, okay? It has to have eaten a blood meal in order to survive. So essentially, you can starve it to death. Correct. If, if you, if, yeah, if you wait long enough... And nobody's there and there's no people. It doesn't attack pets, by the way. So it doesn't feed on pets. The host is is a human. There has to be a human there. I see. Okay. That's good. It's good to know and clarify these things. Now, here's another problem. You've got bed bugs and you go sleep on your couch. Mm. They will follow you. They will detect you and move from room to room looking for that human meal. So you can literally spread it all over the house by sleeping in other areas and not sleeping in the same bed that you were sleeping in. So do they only come out at night? Correct. They okay. only feed at night. Very rarely are you going to see, and you have to have a huge infestation to physically see them like you pull back the sheets on a mattress. It, but that, this is usually happens in, in really, um, in cases where an elderly, that's a big problem of elderly. They don't have people looking after them. Right. And in, in, in neighborhoods where it's very low income, and they don't report it, and they live with it, and they're trying to spray it and control it themselves, and you pull back the sheets, and there's literally hundreds of bed bugs on the mattress. That's when it's been for a year. This is happening for a year or more. Normally, with my type of clients, if they feel a bite, they're calling me and saying, I need you to come and inspect because I, I think I might have bed bugs. And it could happen. I got people that travel a lot. They're, they're, they're professional travelers, and they, they go to all over the world. And they come back and they could literally, even if they stayed at the best hotel, they could still come back with a bed bug. It has has a stigma of being a filth disease or a filth problem. It really isn't. And that's the stigma we need to overcome because it isn't that. 
Yeah, because I think one of the cases in New York was at a Victoria's Secret. Somebody had a bed bug. They were carrying it into the store, and next thing you know, it's infested. And whoever tries on bras or going shopping, they became carrier out of the store and back into their own home. And that is pretty scary, actually. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we're a little coming up to the end of the show. So I just want to ask you a few more questions. So let's say the homeowner is planning to put on the uh, put a home on the market, and during the inspection they found that they may have some sort of pest. So what are some of the quick ways to remove these pests? The quickest way is really to get a professional. Get a professional that can do this quickly for you. I, I tell people, you know, if you're putting a home on the market and you know you're going to put it on the market, get an inspection, you know, 60 to 90 days out. That way you're prepared to make decisions on what you need to do. Because if, if you fail to plan, you're, you're, you're planning to fail. And so 60 to 90 days out, you should be you getting your inspections. If you're, if you're required to do inspections, if you're going to be looking at any problems, you say, yeah, we know we got a problem. You know, get a professional because he might need 30 days to solve this problem for you. It isn't something that can be easily arranged. I mean, if you're selling a home in the winter and it's snowing and you have a termite problem, you can't solve that termite problem into the, into the ground thaws. You can't do it. So it, 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 we have these limitations. If you have a roach problem um, and you've got a large roach problem, we can take up to 30 days to solve that because we're dealing with eggs in the future that are going to hatch. And we have to know this based on the biology to be able to say, yeah, we know that if we've monitored this house for the next 60 days for you, we can pretty much assure that, you know, a guy's not going to be looking through the home and a bug's going to be, you know, coming out when he's actually viewing the home. So that's what I tell people is just plan ahead far enough. 60 to 90 days should be good enough for you uh, for most, most problems. And so what would the homeowners need to budget for when they're hiring pest control professionals? That's going to be really tough to answer because it, it, the North and the South and the East and the West are all in different price markets throughout the country. Right. And also it depends on what kind of pest they got. Yeah, it's usually pest specific because you're dealing at this point, if you're dealing with a homeowner that's selling the home, this is a one-time service. This isn't a recurring account. If you're dealing with a recurring account, you know, uh, you know, average, just to give you an average, a statistical average, it's going to range uh, on an annual basis between somehow between $350 and $650 a year to do general pest control for the average home. So, you know, figure out somewhere between there is, is pretty much where the national averages are. And so do you recommend regularly going through the home and just making sure you're preventing pests? Yes. Yeah, so 90% of our job is actually inspecting and identifying. So when we're coming into the home, we're not doing a whole lot of chemical treatment. We're looking at, okay, what does this home have? If we know that this home has a history of a specific insect, then that's what the technician expertise and the experience is saying. We know that the common problem is an Argentine ant problem in this home. And therefore, we need to monitor for this every time we go because we know where to look for it. And so routine inspections when a person is coming is they should be inspecting that home to ensure that that problem is either under control or it's not going to be a problem where we find it at the first sign of the problem before it actually becomes an infestation. You know, one ant in a kitchen is an infestation, but if you leave it for a couple of weeks, it could be. So first sign, you should be calling your pest guy and saying, hey, I found the roach in the kitchen. I found at first signs. Don't wait. We teach our people to call us at first signs. Don't wait. Even if we're treating, treatment is not a guarantee that we're going to prevent everything. So monitoring and inspection is the number one thing. And do you have any recommendations on hiring? Because there's a lot of pest control companies out there. Yes. Yes. Um, I recommend, uh, you know, believe it or not, um, you know, I'm a... I'm a, I'm a millennial. Uh, I'm a, I'm a Gen Xer trapped in a millennial's body. So I, I, I adopt, <laughs> yeah, I adopt, you know, uh, reviews and, and look at the, the reviews on a company because pest control companies generally don't do millions of services unless right. you're a national brand. And then you'll see the difference between the company that's doing volume work, getting a lot of reviews, but they're getting a lot of three stars. And then you got a company that has maybe 16 reviews but that could be, they do 1,600 jobs. And because most people don't leave reviews, that's a good indicator. 
So if they've got a, a good, you know, honest, you know, you're reading these reviews and they're, and they're talking about the person and it all depends on what you want, whether you want a national company, you want ease of convenience or you want a more personalized service. And so I recommend people really look at the reviews for local companies, not national companies, because our pest problems are local. They're not national. And so local companies have a higher expertise of dealing with local problems than a national company. Well, they're a lot more, you know, they're more versatile in what they can do and what they can customize. A lot of the national brands have strict protocols and this is all we can do. And they have a basically, uh, you know, um, a VIP product, a, a, a minimum viable product. And, and so it all depends. So that's what I tell people is, you know, look at the reviews, get recommendations from your neighbors. Believe it or not, most people will not talk about pest problems openly. So you have to ask your neighbors, what company do you use? Because they won't tell you a lot of the times. And since we live in this new social media world, people are online. They're no longer talking to their neighbors a lot. Um, they're not making recommendations like they used to. So that's another uh, a good tactic for you to find a good pest control company. That's great. And so my last question for you is, what is the number one tip you will give to homeowners when it comes to pest control? Okay. Number one tip, stop spraying immediately. Don't use sprays. You can make the problem worse because you don't understand the chemistry and you don't understand the biology. The number two thing is, again, you know, seal it, create the environment that it's not hospitable to pests. That's great. Thank you so much for being on the show. It was really a pleasure. Like you were so knowledgeable about everything. It was amazing. Thank, thank you so much. It was my pleasure. This episode is brought to you by SocialLightVault.com. Are you overwhelmed with the marketing your home staging business? Stop wasting time worrying or wondering if you're doing the right things. From social media to email newsletter that get attention of listing agents, Social Light Vault makes marketing simple and effective. You don't need a huge marketing budget. You don't need a huge audience either. You just need real marketing tools that work and the right sales funnel to deliver new leads, even when you aren't working. The team at Socialite specializes in marketing for home stagers. Get started today by going to socialitevault.com. So that's it for today's show. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to help and support the show, there are three ways to do so. You can leave a review and rating on iTunes. You can share the show on social media, or you can donate to support the maintaining costs for the podcast. You can make a donation through the show notes or on the sidebar of our site. If you haven't left a review on iTunes, please do so. This will help us grow the show and book more guests. If you have any questions, feedback, and suggestions, you can comment on the show notes. You can also find the show notes by going to stagemore.com slash podcast. That's it. Have a fantastic week and happy staging.